So at the end of episode four of the Python for Beginners, I made a call for questions and y'all have provided them. Uh, we've got a few to answer. Uh, for this video, we're going to answer Josh's question, how do you make an object move as a function of time? So Josh was watching episode four here about animating an object using a loop. So what I've done is I've made a copy of that code here uh, in under a different file name, animation with time. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna make this while loop depend on the time of the simulation. Now, in a sense, we're already doing that. You can think of this I, we called it the loop counter earlier, but in another sense, that's really the time, right? Because frame one, frame two, frame three, etc. each of those is a unit of time. We're just not explicitly referring to this as time. So what we can do instead of using a counter like that, some nameless counter I, we can call this the time. Uh, time doesn't usually start at one, time usually starts at zero. So this is the time in the simulation. Now, if, if you want to, you can explicitly make this uh, seconds, uh, you know, if you make all of your other units appropriate, uh, but we're not going to worry too much about that just yet. We'll just sort of have this be arbitrary units. So it's gonna start at zero, it's gonna move forward by some amount uh, each frame. So that's going to be dt. So we usually want to make that a small number because the smaller you make this uh, this time step size, the smoother the animation is going to be. It's the same rule we saw when we made the step size for the dx. So the smaller you make this time step size, uh, the more smooth the animation will be. Now it's weird to think about this being a step when it's got units of time, but it's the same principle. It's a little bit of change of t instead of a little bit of change of x. So we can delete this now because basically what we need to do is we need to update the sphere's position by using a function of time. Now I'm going to put a comment uh, sign in front of this because uh, we're going to need to reference this later. Uh, when we come back to this, we're going to want to do this in a little bit more sophisticated fashion. What we're going to do right now is we're going to assume that we know what the function, uh, the what function the position of this sphere obeys. Let's say, for example, this sphere's uh, x positions, so that'd be my oops, sphere dot pause dot x. Let's say it goes like the sine of the time. So let's say it goes like sine of t. Sine, actually, let's make it cosine of t. There we go. Um, I'm specifically picking cosine for a reason that'll come up in just a couple minutes. Um, now, of course, we're looping over t now. So instead of having i, we need to have t. And it's here we would put a maximum value for the time. 1,000 is probably okay for that. So let's leave that as a thousand. So we're going to go up to a thousand seconds. The difference is now we're going to have time. I didn't call it T. I called it time. There we go. We're going to have time equals time plus the change in time. So the only change we've made is we've replaced our I, our counter with time. So we're keeping track of time, a, uh, a, a real variable with decimal places, as opposed to an integer I with no decimal places. And we're making this now a function of time. So now this thing is going to go like the cosine. Now we know how a cosine behaves. It starts at one, goes to zero, lowers, lowers out at negative one, comes back to zero, maxes out at one, and keeps repeating that pattern back and forth, back and forth. So that's what we should see when we run this. Oh, uh, T is not identified. Oops, I missed one T. Okay, that is the beautiful thing about Python is that it's pretty gentle with its error messages. It's usually pretty specific in telling you where you made an error. And you can make as many errors as you want in a program as long as we get the last one right. Okay, so here the ball is moving. It started out at one. It's moving in toward the center and then going over toward the left. It's moving a little slow for my taste. So let's increase this rate, say by a factor of 10, control two. Now you notice it jumps from the center over to this way. I should have put its initial at one zero zero, but that doesn't really matter. We'll call that a calibration frame or something. And so here it is, it's going back and forth just like we expected. Now, if we wanted to verify that this was going like the cosine, uh, we would need to make a graph of its motion. We're gonna take a look at that in a future video. That was another question that was posted. It was about how to make a graph. Of course, you can right click and rotate this thing because it's and you can see this moving along the x-axis here. We're looking down on the x-axis and a little bit askew. 
But what's neat about this, and the reason I picked the cosine, is because you're not just limited to doing this in the x direction. You could also do this in the y direction. So in line 11, we're modifying the x component. Now in line 12, we'll modify the y component. And actually, let's change that initial condition while we're thinking about it. Um, so if I left it like this, I'd have both of them going like the cosine of time. It would just be oscillating along a line. That's not really all that interesting. It's not all that different because x is always equal to y. Let's change this one from cosine to the sine. And now I'll give you a second to remember from your math class, if you remember parametric functions, what kind of shape do you get when x is given by the cosine of the independent variable and y is given by the sine of the independent variable? Do we remember what that shape is? Well, you're about to find out. Well, zooming out for a second. Uh, yeah, I always forget to play with the zoom a little bit. What shape do we get here? So the x is going back and forth, just like it did before. So if you think about the x motion independent of the y motion, it's going back and forth. But it's also going back and forth in the y direction. The difference is for the y, when x is at a maximum or a minimum, y is at zero. And when y is at a maximum or a minimum, y, uh, x is at zero. This is making a circle because that's how you make a circle is you make x equal to the cosine and y equal to the sine. Uh, we can see this even more explicitly if we turn on make trail for this shape. Make trail equals true. So make trail is a logical variable that you can assign to a shape. Its default value is false, so that's why we didn't notice anything about it before. Uh, if this thing is false, then nothing special is gonna happen, but if this thing is true, then the shape is going to leave behind a trail marking its path. So you see this little green line here. By default, it's the same color as the shape. I believe you can make it a different color uh, with the right option. And here you can see it makes a circle and it's gonna repeat itself as circles tend to do. And so that's a cool way that you can get a circle. So uh, there you go. Uh, that was Josh. That is how you make an animation a function of time. Uh, you just change your counter to time instead of the uh, instead of the integer counter, and then you put in whatever function you want. Now, of course, this is all under the assumption that you know what functions uh, x and y are going to behave as. But the more interesting stuff in physics is when you don't know what those functions are and you need the computer to come up with those functions for you. We'll take a look at that in a future video when we look at the Euler-Cromer method. So thank you so much for watching. I will see you next time. Bye-bye. It just keeps going round and round. Round and round.